In May, the meeting between the leaders of China and Russia attracted considerable attention from the international community. On the surface, the two sides appeared to have close relations, but behind the scenes, there were undercurrents at play. Through an article published by a Russian think tank, we can gain insights into the subtle maneuvers between the two sides on some sensitive issues. The conflict behind the red carpet, from sanctions to immigration. First, let us talk about how the Sino-Russian trade was under the heavy pressures of sanctions from Europe and the United States. Reuters cited information from sources as saying that the United States threatened to impose secondary sanctions on Chinese banks supporting the Russia-Ukraine war, causing many Chinese banks to refrain from handling Russian payments, directly affecting China's exports to Russia including many dual-use military and civilian products. Data released by the General Administration of Customs of China shows that China's exports to Russia in April fell by 14% year-on-year, dropping from $8.9 billion to $7.6 billion. In the future, the United States may impose even stricter sanctions targeting Chinese banks doing business with Russia. One of Putin's important goals on this trip is how to circumvent regular banking channels or fund circulation. An article from a Russian think tank reveals that the two sides discussed which items could be exchanged using the Chinese yuan and the Russian ruble, which could be exchanged using blockchain technology, and which could be exchanged through barter, thus ensuring that Russia continues to obtain the necessary war and economic materials. This reflects the significant challenges faced by Sino-Russian corporations in the financial and trade sectors under severe U.S. sanctions. The article mentions that Putin may request Xi Jinping to share the discussion content with Macron during his visit to France. Sources pointed out that this reflects Russia's lack of trust in China's stance on the Ukrainian issue, fearing that China may collude with the West behind Russia's back, harming Russian interests. Putin request is actually a probe into China's true intentions. The article points out that Putin is skeptical about the possibility of European countries breaking free from the US control and achieving strategic autonomy, while Xi Jinping hopes to strengthen cooperation with the European Union and the continued deterioration of US-China relations. Analysts believe that this statement clearly reveals Putin's reluctance for Xi Jinping to lean towards Russia while still engaging with the European Union. The article also suggests that the overall goal is to create a highly turbulent and unpredictable world, to undermine the existing international order dominated by the United States and to establish a new order led by China and Russia. However, there is also disagreement between China and Russia on who will dominate the future world order. The article implies that with its powerful nuclear arsenal, Russia believes it should play a more important role in shaping the new order. However, China is unlikely to accept Russia's assertion. This indicates that although China and Russia share common strategic goals, such as containing the United States and reshaping the world order, they have significant differences in specific implementation paths and their respective role positioning. The subtle competition between China and Russia in visa policies, despite their claims of being strategic partners, is intriguing. The author questions why China hesitates to grant visa-free treatment to Russian citizens, especially considering the prosperous economic and trade exchanges along the border of the two countries. This question actually reflects Russia's suspicion that China may harbor certain strategic ambitions in the northeastern region of Russia. As is well known, historically, northeast China was once within the sphere of influence of Imperial Russia and later the Soviet Union. Today, China implements strict visa regulations for Russian citizens. On one hand, this may stem from concerns about a large influx of Russian immigrants. However, at a deeper level, it might be because China recognizes that relaxing restrictions could potentially allow Russia to leverage its disproportia to intervene in the affairs of Northeast China, or even seek to regain control over this geopolitically significant region. At the same time, 
Harbin, as an important city in the northeast region, historically served as a railway hub and commercial center for Imperial Russia. Putin's dedicated visit to the city further highlights Russia's attention and ambitions for this region. From this perspective, the strategic mutual trust between China and Russia is not very solid, and regional affairs have become a new battleground for the two countries' competition. From the Tumen River to the Arctic, the geopolitical ambitions of the CCP. On May 18th, Reuters revealed that China is planning to construct a covert submarine base in the area near the mouth of the Tumen River. They plan to excavate space within the mountains on nearby islands, allowing submarines to directly access the sea from underwater, making the base appear as an ordinary island when viewed from satellites. This strategy is similar to the secretive submarine base near the tip of the Shandong Peninsula, such as Liu Gong Island. Even more concerning, these bases may be disguised as civilian facilities, making it difficult for outsiders to detect their military intentions. It's a dangerous move to conceal military intentions under the guise of peaceful use. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, also intends to create artificial islands in the Sea of Japan by reefing. Once these two projects are completed, they will significantly alter the maritime balance of power in Northeast Asia. Imagine, with a submarine base in the Sea of Japan and a shipyard at the mouth of the Tumen River, it would essentially turn the Sea of Japan into China's inland sea. Moreover, these islands would be equipped with a large number of missiles and could serve as airstrips for aircraft. On the other side, Japan lacks effective military deployment along the coast of the Sea of Japan. Once the Sea of Japan incorporates elements of the CCP's control, the Chinese submarines and missiles exerting influence could naturally feel deeply concerned about its national security. At that point, if China were to engage in unrestricted warfare against Japan, conducting subversion operations and infiltration to coerce Japan to lean towards China, then the situation would become even more complex. According to reports, the seaport at the mouth of the Tumen River has been named Zhebie Port by Xi Jinping. Zhebie means arrow in Mongolian. In the strategic planning map, Zhebie Port is depicted as the arrow tail aimed at Japan, while Japan's main island resembles a bow. Together, they appear to be aiming an arrow. The CCP claims that vessels from this port can reach the United States, but looking at the map, it seems more like to be aimed at the Pacific Ocean. There's not even a hint of aiming at Hawaii. It's as if it's aimed directly at South America. However, whether Russia would allow China to extend its influence into the Sea of Japan, which Russia already considers as an internal sea, remains uncertain. North Korea is also sensitive about territorial sovereignty issues. Although both sides are allied with China, they also have their own calculations. Whether China, Russia, and North Korea can reach a consensus on the Tumen River issue remains to be seen. In fact, the mouth of the Tumen River is the first step in the CCP's Arctic strategy. Establishing submarine bases in the Sea of Japan and building reefs to occupy the Sea of Japan are short-term strategies. The mid-term plan is to subvert Japan, and the long-term goal is to dominate the Arctic. As glaciers melt, the Arctic route opens up to Europe. The CCP clandestinely increases carbon emissions, accelerating global warming, while using carbon emission standards to limit industrial development in Western countries. Eventually, they'll bring European manufacturing to its knees. With Arctic routes established and Siberia becoming suitable for agriculture due to warming, these all become assets for the CCP and part of their decade-long grand plan. Unless the United States manages to bring the CCP under control in these coming years, it will be difficult to thwart their occupation of the Sea of Japan. It seems that it really does require Trump's administration to pull Russia away from China's grip. Putin's visit to China was met with a cold reception, and Shogu was left out in the cold. The future of the Russian Far East and Siberia remains uncertain, with waves stirring at the mouth of the Tumen River. According to a disclosure of a former general from the Russian SVR on February 4, 2022, 
Putin and Xi Jinping signed a secret agreement involving China's support for Russia's military actions against Ukraine. In recent, Russia would allow China to lease and develop certain areas in the coastal borderlands and Siberia, with the leasing plan set to be implemented starting January 1, 2025. However, Putin is now concerned that this move may trigger domestic backlash and hopes to postpone the execution date by a year. Xi Jinping, on the other hand, remains cautious and has not made any specific commitments. With just over half a year until 2025, how both sides decide will be watched with keen interest. The general also revealed that the Russian delegation seemed to have received some form of cold treatment. It is reported that Petrushev, the former secretary of the Russian Security Council, who was appointed as Putin's assistant, had reasons not to visit Beijing to avoid getting a cold shoulder. And indeed, his successor, Shoigu, upon arriving at the venue, was asked to wait outside the door for a full 10 minutes. The Russian delegation was also divided into groups, wearing different colored badges, and were restricted to different areas. Some groups couldn't even access the restroom, leaving many frustrated. Seemingly trivial matters all reveal the subtle deficit of trust between China and Russia. From the current signs, a major sticking point in Sino-Russian relations lies in the previously mentioned leasing agreement. If the agreement is indeed true and implemented, it will undoubtedly deal a huge blow to Putin's regime, and may even accelerate the change of power in the Kremlin, strengthening the forces advocating for Russia to take the path of democratization. At that time, the new Russian regime could easily declare the leasing agreement invalid on the grounds of violating domestic laws, severely undermining China's influence and prospects for economic and trade cooperation with Russia. Furthermore, if Western countries are willing to offer some incentives to Russia, it's not impossible for the new Russian government to break ties with China. In fact, many Russian citizens privately complain that Chinese products are not of good quality and they prefer Western goods. If the West relaxes sanctions on Russia, Russia may also reconsider its stance on the issue of Ukraine. The current joint statement does not mention the leasing agreement for Siberia and the Far East, but the Russian side has agreed to discuss with China the passage of Chinese vessels from the lower reaches of the Tumen River into the Sea of Japan in consultation with the North Korean side. In addition, the statement also mentions that China and Russia will jointly develop the Bolshoi Orsky Island. If Putin indeed agrees to allow Chinese vessels to pass through the 15 kilometer stretch of the Tumen River into the sea, there is no need to seek North Korea's consent. The decision can be made solely by Russia, as long as Chinese vessels use the Russian side of the river channel, it should be sufficient. The mention of North Korea in this context seems to be Putin's way of using it as a shield to prevent Chinese involvement in the broader areas between North Korea and Russia. Therefore, the specific implementation of this agreement still faces numerous uncertainties. It is understood that the railway bridge on the Tumen River is not high enough to accommodate large cargo ships and needs to be rebuilt. Moreover, the river channel leading to the Sea of Japan has many shallow areas, making it difficult for vessels to pass through requiring extensive dragging. These projects would take at least three to five years to complete, not to mention the substantial funding and numerous technical details that need to be discussed. From a strategic perspective, both North Korea and Russia are evidently reluctant to see China gaining control over the Tumen River. Since the end of World War II, the former Soviet Union, when stationed in Northeast China, reached a tactic agreement with the Chinese Communist Party to block the lower reaches of the Tumen River. This was aimed at turning the Sea of Japan into its own internal sea, especially considering the nearby Russian military port of Vladivostok. From a strategic and military standpoint, allowing China access to this area would be highly undesirable for Russia. Therefore, it is unlikely that North Korea and Russia, particularly given their historical context and strategic interests, will easily consent to China's desire in this matter. Some commentators argue that China's strong push for this project is primarily driven by domestic considerations, aiming to boost the economy in Northeast China and stimulate investment in real estate and infrastructure. By promoting the Tumen River project, China can boast that it will be another economic powerhouse 
flowing into the Yangtze River Delta and the Pearl River Delta. In the current economic downturn, this painting a good picture approach may help boost market confidence to some extent. However, whether it can be realized and sustained in the long term remains to be seen. Putin inspects Harbin, Russia's covert control over northeast China, the truth concealed by the CCP, and the old Soviet dream. Northeast, the straw that breaks the CCP's back. In this joint statement, the CCP acknowledges that Russia has inherited all agreements signed by the Soviet Union. This involves the secret agreement regarding Northeast China. During World War II, Northeast China was recognized by Germany and Japan as the independent Manchu Ko. In Stalin's view, it was ultimately reclaimed by the Soviet Union from Japan. The Soviet Union allowed the CCP to manage Northeast China only to guard this island on behalf of the Soviet Union. After all, Northeast China has tens of millions of Han Chinese who all speak Mandarin, making it difficult for the Soviet Union to directly govern. In the past, Mao Zedong had suggested giving Northeast China to Kim Il-sung because Mao knew from the secret agreement with Stalin that Northeast China belonged to the Soviet Union. North Korea was a propped up son of the Soviet Union. So giving Northeast China to Kim Il-sung was essentially giving it to the Soviet Union. Russian Sinologist Sergei Ganchrov in the sixth issue of Far Eastern Issues in 1991 recalled that Stalin's envoy and chief advisor to the Soviet Union in Northeast China, Kavalev, mentioned that Northeast leader Gao Gang had previously proposed to Stalin the issue of establishing Northeast China as the Soviet Union's 17th Republic. Kavlev was in China from 1948 to 1950 and was aware of the direct contacts between Stalin and Mao Zedong on some sensitive issues at that time. Putin's visit to the former Russian colony of Harbin was met with personal reception by the governor of Heilongjiang province, with the provincial party secretary accompanying him throughout the inspection. This sends a clear message. Putin is inspecting his own territory, much like Kim Il-sung did when he visited northeast China. The Kim family has maintained a good relationship with the CCP for generations, with one of the purposes being to control this region. Putin laid flowers at the monument to Soviet Red Army martyrs in Harbin, indicating that this land was conquered by the Soviet Union and has no relation to the CCP. The monument began construction shortly after Japan surrendered in 1945 and was completed in November on the October Revolution Day. Harbin Institute of Technology, HIT, was founded by Russians in 1920, and later, during the CCP's rule, it came under the management of the Central Military Commission, where it trained a large number of military industrial elites for the CCP. Putin's visit to HIT sends a signal that the industrial foundation of the CCP originates from Russia. Currently, Russia aims to take away the CCP's military industrial base, including the three northeastern provinces. It is rumored that before Putin's visit to China, there was a significant presence of Russians in Harbin. Putin hopes to turn Harbin into a second Valdostok. During the Beijing talks, Putin formally raised this request to Xi Jinping. Currently, Xi Jinping has not formally responded, but there has been no official publicity about Putin's visit, for fear of public awakening and potential rebellion. The resolution of these issues, if it ever materializes, may have to wait until after the dissolution of Russia, the downfall of Kim regime in North Korea, and the disbandment of the CCP before the Northeast can be jointly developed by neighboring countries. While the Sino-Russian alliance is a fact, the relationship between the two countries is not set in stone, and each still retains room for its own interests. Last March, when Xi Jinping met with Putin, a knowledgeable individual predicted that the Sino-Russian border would be blurred. It seems that prediction has come true. This individual also suggested that if Kim Jong-un were to control the entire Baekdu mountain amid turmoil, Beijing might lose its status as a capital or even relocate. The economy of Northeast China is already in a dire state, and doing business with Russia is not profitable. With a formidable opponent like Putin, 
Signs of a resurgence of the Manchukuo 2.0 in the region has already been emerging. Within a year or so, both officials and ordinary people in the Northeast, even those sympathetic to Russia, will stand up. Cities like Dalian, Shenyang, Tongchun, and Harbin will suffer. Once the Northeast is in turmoil, it will become the final straw to crush the CCP. Although China and Russia have established a strategic partnership, there are still significant differences on key issues, making it difficult to achieve genuine unity. These issues include dealing with Western sanctions, shaping the future international order, geopolitical competition in China's Northeast, and competition and cooperation in technology and military domains. In addressing sanction issues, China and Russia share common interests, but coordinating specific strategies prove challenging. In global governance, both sides seek to expand their influence, yet there is competition over leadership allocation. In regional affairs, Russia eyes China's northeast with suspicion. While China seeks to expand its influence to Siberia and the Far East, even in technology and military cooperation, disagreements arise over issues like intellectual property rights and the distribution of benefits. It can be said that the alliance between China and Russia is more about countering the US-led counter-international order, but on fundamental issues such as how to build a new order and maximize their own interests, the strategic differences between the two countries cannot be ignored. This sleeping in the same bed with different dreams situation determines the fragility and uncertainty of the China-Russia relationship. Therefore, when observing the interactions between the two countries, one should not be misled by surface intimacy, nor should one have overly high expectations for the depth and breadth of their strategic cooperation. Through various signs, it should be noted that against the backdrop of increasingly prominent differences in interests, the China-Russia relationship is facing new tests and challenges. Thank you.